Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for So the Baker Bakes Bagels. I had to practice that earlier, so I didn't mess it up. <laughs> My name is Megan, and I'm the Programs and Exhibits Supervisor at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. For more programs to keep you entertained and informed, visit our programs calendar at ahml.info. Our next culinary-esque program will be Drinking Games in History on Monday, May 24th from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Time. I am delighted to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Bill the Baker. Uh, Bill has been baking breads for almost 50 years, and although most of his working career has been spent in different facets of the technology industry, his passion has always been baking breads. In recent years, Bill discovered that he loves to teach people and wants to share his passion with everyone. He enjoys that the same four simple ingredients of flour, salt, yeast, and water can produce an endless variety of options. And with that, Bill, thank you for joining us tonight. And I will go ahead and turn it on over to you. Thank you very much, Megan. <clears throat> and thank you, everybody. Welcome to my kitchen. My name is Bill Reichman and I'm going to teach my bagel class tonight. Uh, normally this class would be taught over two days, uh, one day where we make the dough and the next day where we come back together and actually bake the bagels that we uh, made on day one. I've, I've taken this class and I've tried to eliminate all of the delays that take place when you are making bagels. So if we stay on task, we should be putting bagels in the oven tonight at around 7.35. And as Megan said, we'll have time for uh, questions. If we do not have enough questions to fill the 16 minute period that the bagels will be baking, I will show you how to make a cream cheese spread that I use for my bagels. Um, if we run past the eight o'clock because there are too many questions, I will stay beyond the eight o'clock and demonstrate how to make that cream cheese spread uh, for those that want to stay. For those of you that are interested in getting the recipe for the cream cheese spread, I have three of them that I use tonight. We're going to make a vegetable cream cheese spread. If you go to my website at billthebaker.com, sometime tomorrow I'll get those recipes up there. Uh, there are recipes on the website now. I just do not have the cream cheese spread there. So tomorrow afternoon, if you go, go back, check buildthebaker.com, you'll be able to see that cream cheese spread. When you come to my classes, uh, as you did tonight, uh, you came to learn how to make bagels. I have a totally different objective when I have you in class. My goal is to try to introduce you and teach you the science of baking. I'm a very strong believer in baking is a science, unlike cooking, which I consider it to be an art. And the more you understand the science of baking, the more in control you are of the process. And by controlling the process, you're in control of the quality of the items that you bake. So I try to teach you good habits and I try to teach you science of baking. One of the habits I try to teach is that before you attempt to make something, read the recipe, make sure that you understand it, make sure that you have all of the correct ingredients, the emphasis on the word correct, pre-measure those ingredients out. The French call it, I believe it's pronounced mise en place. It's having everything in its place. In tonight's recipe, we're going to actually use four ingredients. We do have flour, salt, yeast, and water but we have one extra ingredient, which is a diastatic malt powder. And I'll explain the role of the diastatic malt powder later on when we get down to the questions and answers. So I have my ingredient number one, two, three, four, and five. I've got flour, yeast, salt, and diastatic malt powder and water. I'm going to start by putting the salt into my uh, bread flour. Anytime I add ingredients to the flour, my habit is I whisk them to hide them. I just added the diastatic malt powder. And now I'm going to add the instant yeast. Notice I said instant yeast, not active dry. And then finally, I'm going to add the, the warm water. 
I'm going to put this on my stand mixer. And if you look, you'll notice I'm using the dough hook. I'm not using the paddle attachment. The paddle attachment would put too much of a strain on the mixer trying to mix this dough. This dough is going to be extremely hard dough. So I'm going to mix it. I'm going to run the mixer for as long as it takes for all of the ingredients to disappear. I will show you what it looks like in the bowl of my mixer. You can see there's a tremendous amount of dry ingredients down there. I'm going to run it until all those dry ingredients disappear. It'll take a minute or two, maybe even three. But I can tell you, if we had the paddle attachment in there, the mixer would be straining at this point. And don't attempt to do this with a handheld mixer. If you do not have a stand mixer, you're going to have to mix it and knead it by hand. So the dough is starting to come together, but you can see it's still fragmented into a lot of small pieces. There are dry ingredients at the bottom of the bowl. You may not see it on the camera, but I can see it from the kitchen here. We're getting closer. You can tell the mixer is starting to slow down. Almost there. Okay, I think we're there. We have one piece of dough, a couple of little stragglers at the bottom. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a clean dish towel. I'm going to cover the bowl of the mixer and I'm going to set a timer for five minutes. So we have five minutes that we can talk. So let's talk about the ingredients for a second. We used bread flour and we used diastatic malt powder. We used instant yeast. We used salt and water. And when you put those ingredients together in a bowl and mix them, if the water is warm, the first thing that happens is the yeast wakes up the yeast is a living organism. It's just in a dormant state. You can think of it as sleeping. The yeast wakes up and it starts to eat and it eats sugar. Some of you might be questioning, well, how could it eat sugar when we didn't put sugar into the bowl? We put diastatic malt powder, but that's not sugar. The sugar comes from nature itself. There are, if you look at the ingredients in the flour, I happen to have a bag of bread flour here. This is King Arthur bread flour, which is what I'm using. You see this number right here, 12.7%. That means 12.7% of this bag was proteins and the remaining 80, can't do the math real fast, 81 or 82%, 81% is starch. There are also some enzymes that are naturally present. And when you put water into that mix, the enzymes start to attack the starch. And the visual that I like to use in class is think of the starch as candy bars in wrappers. The enzymes attack the wrappers and take the wrappers off of the candy bar and expose that sugar to the yeast. So the, the sugar has plenty, I'm sorry, the yeast has plenty of sugar to eat as long as the enzymes do their job. The yeast is going to eat. It's going to start giving off gas and alcohol. You don't have to worry about the alcohol unless you're making beer or wine. Um, the alcohol that's going to be produced in the bagels will dissipate in the oven as soon as the oven heat hits the alcohol. There'll be no alcohol in the bagels when you, when you take them out of the oven. But it's going to trap, I'm sorry, it's going to produce gas. 
And we want that gas to be trapped inside of the bagel so that it lifts the bagel up in height. And in order to do that, we need to develop gluten. Gluten is not naturally present in wheat flour. Everybody thinks it's there by itself. Um, it's not. That 12.7% protein, there are two specific proteins in that number. They are gliadin and glutenin. And when you knead the dough, which is what we're going to do next, you make those glutenin proteins bump into each other end to end. And if they are wet when they bump into each other, they form a real tight bond and you end up with long chains of gluten and proteins. And those proteins forming long chains actually form gluten. So we chose bread flour because it has the most amount of proteins of all of the flours that we can buy in our supermarket. This is 12.7%. All purpose flour from King Arthur is 11.2. Cake flour is less and pastry flour is even less. We chose the 12.7 because we want these bagels to have a lot of chew when we bite on them. Think about what it's like to bite into a bagel versus a piece of bread, I'm sorry, a piece of cake. When you bite into a bagel, you're chewing quite a while. When you bite in a piece of cake, you're lucky to bite into it once. And what you are chewing on is gluten. So by having the maximum amount of protein that we could get locally, we will end up with the maximum amount of gluten and we'll end up with a nice chewy bagel. So that was the reason for choosing the bread flour. What we're doing with this five minute delay is we're allowing those proteins to absorb some water and the starch is absorbing water as well before we start the kneading process. We're only going to knead this for three minutes. There's the timer now telling us that we're ready. One of the things that you have to be careful of when you knead this dough with your dough hook is the dough hook sometimes has a tendency to throw the dough off to the side. Do not attempt to push it back under the dough hook while the mixer is running. Turn the mixer off, position the dough under the dough hook, lower it back down and turn it back on again. So I'm going to set a timer for three minutes. I'm going to start on speed one. You can see right now, I have to change the camera. You can see right now the dough hook has a good grasp on the dough. Spinning it around, it's kneading it, stretching it out. And it's making those proteins bump into each other. And the more they bump into each other, the longer the chains become. And we end up with that gluten network that we wanted that will trap the gas inside of the bagel. So this is only going to run for three minutes. Remember, if the dough comes out from under the dough hook, don't attempt to push it back down with a wooden spoon or with your fingers. You cause serious damage to yourself or the mixer. Just turn the mixer off, reposition it, and turn it back on. And you should be able to do that fast enough that you do not have to extend the three minutes of kneading time. Kneading the dough. We have a minute and a half to go. The dough hook still has a hold of the dough.
It's losing one of the pieces now. One of the pieces is stuck out on the outside. I'm going to turn the mixer off and reposition it. And just turn it right back on. Another 30 seconds. So that's all it takes to make six wonderful bagels. The dough is very stiff, very hard to work with at this point. What you're going to do when you make them is you're going to take a, a mixing bowl, spray it with a little baker's spray. Baker's spray is nothing more than canola oil. If you do not have a baker's spray, you can just put a couple of drops of oil in your bowl, I'm gonna put this baker spray. You can see it's just canola oil. Then I push the dough down to the bottom and I swish it around. And when I turn it over, the top of the dough is shiny. It picked up the oil that was at the bottom of the, the bowl. And now I'm going to cover it with plastic wrap and get it into the refrigerator. So let me just make some room. I want to make sure the plastic wrap is on there tight so the dough does not dry out. I'll get that out into the refrigerator in a little while. And it will stay in the refrigerator until an hour and a half before you're going to make bagels. So yesterday I made some dough. And about an hour and a half ago, I took that dough out of the refrigerator and I cut it into six equal sized pieces. Now I'm going to show you how to pre-shape a bagel. I said pre-shape, not shape. You can see that this piece had one or two cuts of dough to get to the correct, here's the extra piece of dough. I'm just gonna push all that dough down to degas this a little bit. And then I'm going to pull the sides up and squeeze them into each other and form what looks like a large head of garlic. So there's that large head of garlic. What I'm doing with this step is I'm defining what is going to be the top of my bagel. The top of my bagel is that other side that every time I pull on the sides and squeeze it to the back. Every time I do that, this skin stretches tighter and tighter. And I'm just gonna pull it a couple of more times. I want this to be nice and smooth on top. So I'm going to pre-shape all six of these. Now, if I were making cinnamon raisin bagels, the day I mixed the dough, I would have added one more dry ingredient, which was the cinnamon. And I would have added the raisins at the end of the kneading process. So I would knead it for three minutes, and then I would add the raisins, run it for another minute, and then probably finish hand kneading the dough to incorporate all those raisins. So I'm making these nice and smooth. And remember, this is pre-shaping the bagel. Check 
checking the top, make sure it's smooth. I wanna make it a little smoother. I'll just pull a little more of that skin to the back and pinch it together. Two more to go. Make that head of garlic first. And then just keep pulling and squeezing the excess dough to the back so that the top is nice and smooth. And one more to go. Now, if I were making a cheese bagel, Parmesan or Asiago cheese, I would have flattened this dough first and I would have put some grated cheese on top of the disc that I flattened out. And then I would press that cheese in, pick the disc up and do this and turn it back into a ball. Okay, so this was pre-shaping. As soon as you get the dough pre-shaped, you're going to start shaping the bagel. And I'm gonna show you how to shape the bagel. This is one of two ways to do it. This is the way that I like to do it in class because the student has much better control. I'm going to use my middle finger and my thumb, and I'm going to put a piece of dough between them, and I'm going to wiggle my fingers back and forth until I can finally feel the tips of my thumb and middle finger. And then when I do that, I'm going to elongate the motion so that the hole gets bigger. So I start by putting my thumb on the center of the bottom of the bagel. Remember this bottom of the bagel was on the counter. I put my middle finger in the center of the top of the bagel and I start moving back and forth. And then as soon as I can feel my finger, now I'm going to make the motion a little bit wider so that it opens up a hole in the center. You start by making the bagel about three inch, about a three inch hole in the center of the bagel, which makes it look not like a bagel at all. But you do, you wanna concentrate on making the perimeter of the bagel equal all the way around as best you can. And then place it down on the counter with that hole opened up. I'll show it to you again. Now, because we're using plain bagel dough, we are going to be able to turn these bagels into a fairly large number of different bagel types. We could make plain bagels, of course. We could make poppy seed bagels, cinnamon bagels, um, everything bagels. We could make cinnamon sugar bagels. You could make onion bagels. It all depends on the topping that you put on the bagel. Three more to go. Each time I do it the same way. Two more to go. I'm going to start a pot of water on my stove. Of course, we're gonna use that for the bath. And one more to go. Going to put a light coat of Baker's spray on top of the bagels.
just so the plastic wrap that I put on top does not stick to them. And I'm going to let these bagels sit on the counter covered with plastic for 30 minutes. And during that time, the bagels are going to fill up with gas. And that's the gas that the yeast is giving off because the yeast, yeast is eating sugar. So here's, switch the camera again. Here are six bagels that ne now need a half an hour to fill up with gas. Here are six bagels that I pre-shaped just before the class started and they should be ready to go. And we know that they're ready to go by giving them a float test. I'm going to get a small pot with some water in it. This room temperature water. So here's the pot with the water. I'm going to give this a float test, which means I'm, I'm going to pick it up very carefully. There you can see the bagel is floating in the water. So that float test is telling us that we are ready to start the boiling process. So I'm gonna to have to wait a few minutes for that water to come up. Let me explain what we are going to do with the boiling process. And we can come back and talk about that diastatic malt powder at the same time. And this is gonna us, push us about 10 minutes behind schedule. We got plenty of time. Okay, so we're going to put these bagels into a bath because we're trying to cause something specific to happen. Let's back off of bagels for a second and talk about what happens when you put a piece of bread dough in the oven after it has risen and filled with gas from the yeast. When you put that piece of dough in the oven, you initiate a race between two competitors. And the two competitors are the gas that's trapped inside, trying to expand as it gets hot, because the property of gas is that when it gets, when you heat gas, it expands. So when we put those bagels in the oven with the gas or the bread in the oven with the gas trapped inside, the, the oven heat starts to penetrate the dough, it heats the gas, the gas expands and the the bread starts to rise or the bagels will start to rise. The other competitor in that race though is sugar that's on the outside of the, the dough when it goes into the oven. And the answer to how did the sugar get, get there is the same way um, the sugar got there for the yeast to eat. The enzymes were taking wrappers off of starch leaving sugars exposed. And those sugars are on the outside of the dough of a bagel or bread. So the two competitors are the gas that's trying to expand and the sugars that's trying to, um, I'm, I'm losing the word now, but the sugars are caramelized, I'm sorry. The sugars are going to caramelize. So whoever wins the race determines the outcome. If the sugars caramelize before the gas expands, the bread doesn't spring up. If the gas expands before the sugars caramelize, then the bread does in fact spring up and bakers call that oven spring. Well, with a bagel, we, we do not want oven spring. Nobody wants a bagel that's about the size of a, um, a softball. Everybody wants a bagel that's a little bit smaller in size and much denser. You want that dough to be dense. 
but we filled the bagel with gas. We know that because it just passed the float test. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the bagels into a bath solution. And that bath solution is going to do a number of things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to heat the gas that's trapped inside and expand it. But it's going to, it's going to heat the, the bagel inside and kill the yeast. So when the bagels go in the oven, there'll be no more yeast production. The yeast will, be, will have expired. It will not be eating sugars and it will not be producing any more gas. So the only gas that we're going to be able to take advantage of is the gas that's already trapped inside before we put the bagels into the bath. But the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to add some baking soda to the water. And for those of you that remember chemistry, you, you may, might remember that there was something called a pH scale. And the pH scale measures how acidic or basic alkaline a solution is. And by putting the baking soda into the bath water, we are making that bath solution more alkaline. And the reason we're doing that is the caramelization of sugars takes place much more rapidly in an alkaline environment as opposed to an acidic environment. So by putting the bagels into an alkaline solution, we are accelerating the caramelization of the sugars. And I said we would also come back and talk about the diastatic malt powder. Diastatic malt powder, you can think of it as a steroid for the enzymes. Remember the enzymes are what got wet and started to attack the starch. When you put diastatic malt powder into that environment, it's like putting the enzymes on steroids. So the enzymes are going to produce a lot more sugar. We're going to have a lot more sugar on the crust or the outside of the bagel. We're changing the pH factor from neutral to alkaline, which accelerates caramelization. So the bagels are going to start forming their crust in the bath solution at the same time that we're killing the yeast which will prevent the bagels from getting even bigger when they went into the oven. So that's the reason for the bath solution and the ingredients that we put into it. Um, the other ingredient that I'm putting in tonight, I have to tell you that there are really two kinds of bagels in the market. They're Montreal bagels and they are New York style bagels. We are making a New York style bagel by the dough that we made. But we're going to break one of the rules and put uh, honey in the water. And we're doing that because I asked you to do it because I like what the honey does to the bagels. So a, a New York bagel, if you ever get into a conversation with a real baker and tell him that you made a New York style bagel with honey in the water, you will lose that fight um, because honey's not supposed to be in the water. I like it. So I'm going to use it. You of course can leave it out if you wanted to do that. So my water is ready to go. I wanna show you real quickly what we're going to do. We're going to take three bagels one at a time, put it face up. We're gonna go over to the water, flip it over so it's in the, in the water face down. We're gonna set a timer for one minute. At the end of that one minute, we're going to flip it over and set a timer for 30 seconds. I'm going to reduce the boiling down to a simmer so that I can safely add the baking soda. You have to do it very gradually, otherwise you will turn white. I'm going to add the honey. I'm going to give it a stir and turn the heat back up to high. I want the water to be boiling. Okay. 
At the end of the 30 seconds, after I flip the bagel over, I'm going to take it out and put it onto a cooling rack. And then I'm going to put the next three bagels in and set that timer up. I'm putting the bagels in the water now. I set a timer. I'm going to try to switch this camera over. I'm going to flip them over. Set a timer for 30 seconds. Be careful, make sure that water doesn't boil over. At the end of the 30 seconds, I'm going to lift the bagels out with this soup skimmer. You can use a slotted spoon if you don't have a soup skimmer. But I'm lifting the bottom of the bagel out. So if there's any mark left on the bagel, it's going to occur on the bottom of the bagel. So they're on the cooling rack. Putting the next three bagels in, face down, set a timer for 60 seconds. And now I'm going to transfer those original three bagels to a piece of parchment paper that has some cornmeal on it so that I can reposition them if I need to, I need to leave space in between the bagels in case they get a little bit bigger. I'll be driving you all crazy with running in front of the camera. At the end of this 60 seconds, I'll flip them over. Okay, I'm flipping them over. Set a timer for 30 seconds. And the last thing I'm going to do before they go in the oven is I'm going to put an egg wash on the bagels and I'm going to apply the seeds that I'm going to use. I'm going to take these bagels out of the water, put them on the cooling rack, I'm going to start egg washing those first three bagels. Make sure I get down into the center of the bagel and all the way around the sides. This egg wash is going to do a couple of things. It's going to, by itself, prevent the bagel from getting bigger because it too is going to harden just like the sugars are going to caramelize. It's also going to change the color of the bagel when it bakes. And it's going to act like a glue for the seasoning that I'm putting on. So I'm putting on an everything bagel spice
transfer the other three. Put on the egg wash again. It's not a lot of egg. You put too much egg on, it ends up you have scrambled eggs on the side of your bagel. Just a light coating. And make sure you get it all around the sides, down in the middle. And now I'm going to put on some sesame seeds. I'm going to pull the camera back so you can see them going into the oven. Put them on the pizza stone. Set a timer for eight minutes. Switch the camera so you can see me. There, that was a race. I don't know how many questions you have, Megan, if you have any. Yes, we do, we do. Some of them are double up, so I'll try and combine them. Um, where can we get malt powder from? You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at King Arthur Flour. Um, I am told you can buy it at local brew shops where you make your own beer. I've never tried to buy it there. But one word of caution about the diastatic malt powder. There's a, another product that is sold with a very similar sounding name, which is called non-diastatic malt powder. They are two completely different products used for two completely different reasons. The diastatic malt powder is what you wanna to use to enhance bread crust or bagel crust. And you want to be real careful when you use diastatic malt powder. If you are a bread baker, I know you strive to get that nice thick crust on your breads. Don't think that if you add more diastatic malt powder, you'll end up with even thicker crust. You will end up with chewing gum inside of the bread. It literally turns the interior, the crumb into chewing gum. Use what the recipe tells you to use. So Amazon and King Arthur are certainly two very prominent places where you can find it. Great. Um, can you use any type of yeast, either dry yeast, rapid rise, or fresh yeast, or is active dry the ideal one? Active dry was not the ideal. We used instant. Um, you can use the other yeasts, but you need to understand how they differ. Instant yeast can be placed directly into the flour and then the water added into the flour yeast mixture. Active dry yeast should really be proofed in water first. So if you, if you were to take the recipe we used tonight, my suggestion would be measure all your ingredients out, including your active dry yeast. Put a pinch of sugar in the water that you measured out from the recipe. Stir in your active dry yeast. Mix it. Let it sit for five or ten minutes and it will become a looks like a glass of beer with a head on it. That means you know that the yeast has come to life. And now you can add that yeast water mixture into your dough. Great. Um, do you have any tips for people who do not have a stand mixer? You can do it all by hand. Absolutely by hand. This is the best mixer you can get. Just put all those ingredients in the bowl and just, just do like that. Just squeeze and let the dough come out between your fingers. And when it finally all comes together, let it rest for five minutes and then hand knead the dough. You just, you push down on the ball of dough with this part of your hand, flatten it down, fold it over, 
push it down again, fold it in a different direction, and you just keep pushing and folding for three minutes, and then you're good to go. Great. And then for everybody who has a stand mixer, um, what speed did you have it on? Speed one. Speed one. On, on my mixer, it says STIR, S-T-I-R, but it is speed one. Um, let's see. And there's a couple that we went through, so I'm going to scan through here. Okay, so um, we have someone who is trying to cut down on using plastic wrap. Um, can they use um, to cover their bowl, like the lid that came with the bowl, or does it have to be? No, they, they, could, they could use a dish towel, as long as it's a clean dish towel. Perfect. Uh, that's for the, the dough when it's on the counter. When mm -hmm. you put the dough in the refrigerator, you can just put a a lid on the container. Perfect. Um, can you make this same recipe into mini bagels? And then what would the baking time be for that? The, the answer is yes. And the answer is I don't know because I don't know how much smaller you're going to make them. I, I would suggest instead of eight minutes on each side, and I'm sorry, not on each side, I put them in the oven for eight minutes at the end of eight minutes, I'm going to rotate the paper 180 degrees, bringing the bagels that were in the back up to the front. Um, you would do that even if you're using smaller bagels. And then what I would suggest you doing is that on that second eight minutes, after five of those eight minutes, I would start taking the temperature with an instant read thermometer I had an instant read thermometer, here it is. This is one example of an instant read thermometer. It's called instant read because when I put it in, I will instantly get the results here. You're looking for 190 to 200 degrees at least. So after five minutes of the second eight minute bake, you might be there at that 200 and, and you can take the, the bagels out at that point. Great, great, great. But one of the things you wanna to try to do is use a scale because you don't wanna have small bagels and big bagels all on the same tray trying to bake evenly. It's, it's not gonna work well. Um, we have somebody who is interested in the cinnamon and, and raisins that you talked about earlier. Um, when you add them to the dough, are you doing that before you divide them into your mini six, six bagel balls? Yeah, when you, when you mix the dough, as we did at the very beginning of this class, you would add cinnamon as one of the extra ingredients right from the start. So you would add flour, salt, yeast, diastatic malt powder, and cinnamon. Whisk them all, add the water, knead the dough, well, you're going to mix the dough first, then let it rest, then knead the dough for three minutes. And at the end of the three minutes, you're going to add the raisins, still running the mixer on speed one. It'll take about a minute or two to incorporate most, but not all of the raisins. And then at that point, take what's in the bowl of the mixer and put it on your counter and hand knead the rest of the raisins into the dough. If you keep running the mixer, you'll end up squashing, squishing the raisins. It gets kind of messy. The other thing that you need to remember is that cinnamon raisin bagels don't always pass a float test in 30 minutes. So let me go back now and show you what the bagels look like in the oven. The first eight minutes are up and we're going to rotate the oven or rotate the bagels in the oven. They look like bagels for sure. And you can see the back of the bagels are very dark. I pushed that bagel right here a little too far back into the oven. And I burned that bagel in the back. I have eight minutes. 
I want to check one thing. Okay. More questions? More questions. Yes, yes. So we have a couple questions about um, the egg wash that you use. Yes. Um, one of them, can you do um, an egg white egg wash? You can do an egg white. Um, it will have less color. There's, there's three different kinds of egg wash. There's the egg white, the egg yolk, and then the whole egg. The egg yolk is the darkest in color producing. The whole egg is a little less dark and the egg white is even less dark. And it's because the proteins which cause the darkness are in the yolk itself. But yes, you can use the egg white um, and you'll get this, you'll get the adhesive effect that you're looking for, for any toppings that you're putting on, um, but you'll get lighter color. And then we have several people interested in the honey that you added to your, to your water. So um, what, did it, what does that actually do to um, the baking process? Well, it, the, if you looked at the recipe, they, oh, they haven't seen the recipe yet. Not yet. Yep. <laughs> when you get the recipe, it's going to tell you that if you do not have diastatic malt powder, you can substitute uh, honey in its place. Because you remember the, the diastatic malt powder really increases the enzyme activity, the end result being I have more sugar. So with the enzymes not having the diastatic malt powder boosting their activity, we would have less sugar in that dough. So by putting honey into it, we're pushing the sugar level back up again. So the diastatic malt powder can be substituted with honey. Um, I prefer to use the diastatic malt powder myself, but I've had many of students use the honey and, and, and love the bagels that they make. And of course the, the honey is going to impart a little bit of flavor in the bagel which if you like honey, which I do, um, that's not a bad thing. Uh, what is your favorite seasoning for bagels? Um, I've this year figured out how to make pumpernickel bagels. And I love pumpernickel bagels with cream cheese and chives. That is my absolute favorite. My next challenge is figuring out a good quality chocolate chip bagel. It's, it's not a matter of just throwing chocolate chips into a bagel, as I found out. I'm getting close, but I'm not there yet. A couple more bakes and I'll have those figured out. Excellent. Oh. Um, does it matter what type of bowl you use to put the dough in the fridge? No. No, none at all. Easy answer. Excellent. Yeah, the dough is not going to react with the bowl at all. Um, why do you use instant yeast? Because I can put it directly into the flour, eliminating the need to having to proof the yeast first. And there's, there's another yeast. I don't think I have, I don't have, my yeast is in my refrigerator, but what I use is actually something called SAF, the letters SAF gold. I use SAF gold yeast because this is gonna be the real scientific part of the class. SAF gold yeast is osmotolerant yeast. You need osmotolerant yeast when you start altering the osmotic pressure of the dough by increasing the amount of sugars. So if you, if you wanna have a yeast that's all purpose, the SAF gold yeast can be used in your sweet doughs 
It can be used in your bread doughs and it can be used anywhere you use yeast. It's an instant yeast and it's SAF gold. Then you don't have to worry about how much sugar is in this, in this dough and, and be disappointed because your dough didn't rise because you put too much sugar into it. But it has to do with osmosis and osmotic pressure and that's, that's really the science beyond this class, I think. So we have a couple of people who do not have a pizza stone. Does it matter if you use one or not? According to my younger son, my wife and I have two sons. Um, one of the debates that he and I have on a regular basis is he refuses to use a pizza stone when he makes bagels. So if you talk to my son, he will tell you absolutely, you do not have to have a pizza stone, just use a cookie sheet or a sheet pan. Very good. We have, oh man, there was a lot of that question. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that we got to that one. <laughs> um, so if you're using a convection oven, do you still need to rotate the bagels that are in the oven to even you, it out? Say that again, if you're using- A convection oven. You should not use a convection oven. All uh, right. I, I, let me back up. You can use a convection oven if you know how to use it meaning you know how to alter the time and temperature and, and you're correct, you would not have to rotate the bagels if you were using a convection oven. Very good. There's a lot of questions that will be answered in the recipe, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip over those. Um, just know that we will be sending out this recipe immediately after um, this program. So you will have all of that information, including temperature, how long, um, to leave things in, stuff like that. Um, we do have a question asking where you learned your culinary skills. That's a wonderful question. That's a real long answer, unfortunately. <laughs> but let me just show you what came out of the oven first, including the burnt one. I need to be honest with everybody. I made a mistake. <laughs> how we know it's a live program. <laughs> so here's what came out of the oven. Nice Beautiful. color. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was in the back of the oven, too close to the wall of the oven, and it, it just burned. But the rest, the rest are perfect. Um, the answer to that question was the culinary skills. I was never... Um, a cook or a baker, as you mentioned at the beginning of the program. Um, my, all of my education up through, I would say the last 10 years of my life uh, was all in books. And then in the last 10 years of my life, I, I attended some classes. I belonged to the Bread Bakers Guild of America which is an organization that anybody can belong to. And they have a wonderful, or they had a wonderful um, roadshow education program, but with COVID that all stopped. Um, so I, I stopped my membership for now, but I did attend classes wherever I could take a class. As a matter of fact, next week, I'm going to take a class again. I'm going to take a virtual class. So all of my education came out of books and I, and I I have a ton of bread baking books. It is a passion for me, baking. Um, so this is the bagels. We're at the end, we're eight, well, two minutes past eight o'clock. If you want, I'll be happy to show you how to make the cream cheese spread. Do we have enough people, Megan, to? We do, we do. Yeah, so it is eight o'clock if you do have to leave. We enjoyed having you tonight. Um, however, uh, Bill is gonna do one more demonstration for the spread, which will be posted on his website. Um, you can check back tomorrow for that. Yes, we have a lot of people in chat saying yes to the cream cheese spread. <laughs> the first thing you'll, you'll see tomorrow 
is the recipe is going to be for two bars of cream cheese. And if you're using two bars of cream cheese, you're going to double all of the things that I'm using tonight. But the recipe will be for two bars of cream cheese and the correct number of ingredients. So I'm going to use celery. I'm going to use a food processor. I'm going to use celery, a carrot, red pepper, and some radish. Sorry, I'm putting the radishes in. So all I did was simply process through a food processor and shredded those ingredients. So if you do not have a food processor, you, you can just grate those ingredients on your own grater. Now let me switch the camera. I'm going to take one bar of cream cheese. Without my glasses, this is a lot harder than you think. So it's room temperature cream cheese. Going to put all of it in to start. I want to see how wet. Sometimes the the, the uh, vegetables carry a little bit more water than others, and it gets too wet. So I always put in just about three quarters of the vegetable. I'm going to add chopped green onions. So I had, I had chopped these on a cutting board. And all I'm doing is mixing it up with a rubber spatula. I also had some pepper that I measured out. And as I said, all of this is in the recipe. And I can see that this will be able to take the additional vegetables. So I'm putting it all in. And I can pretty much guarantee you that you have never tasted vegetable cream cheese spread until you've made your own. You are going to be amazed at the flavors that you get out of your fresh vegetables. I also have two other cream cheeses that I use when I teach classes. I'll have those recipes on the website for you tomorrow as well. One of them I call berry, berry cream cheese. I take freeze-dried cranberries, blueberries, and tart cherries. I think it's about a half a cup of each. I put some boiling water over the top and I let them sit for about 20 minutes to hydrate. I drain them, I cut them up with a knife and I put them in a bar of cream cheese just the way I did the vegetable. I taste it. 
If I want it to be a little bit sweeter, I just add a couple of drops of honey, mix it up, taste it again, and I just keep adding honey until I'm satisfied on the sweetness. The other cream cheese that I make in class is honey almond. And I use uh, almonds. I chop the almonds up to, to real tiny, tiny pieces in a food processor. Um, I forget how many almonds. It's like 22 almonds per bar. Um, I chop them up, put them in the cream cheese, do the same thing with the honey to make it sweeter. And I end up with honey almond, berry berry, and vegetable cream cheese. And then of course, cream cheese and chives. Now that the chives are back in the garden, I can make cream cheese and chive. They, they are incredibly good cream cheese spreads. And as I said, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you've never tasted a vegetable cream cheese as good as the one you're going to make yourself. And then when you put it on your own homemade bagels, it's just that much better. So that's it. That's the class for tonight. Um, I'm not going anywhere. If there's more questions, I'll be happy to answer them. But if not, then it's time for us to say goodbye. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. I'm so excited. I haven't eaten dinner yet. So just like talking about all this cream cheese and bagels is like making me salivating. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Bill, for your time. Don't and, forget, uh, for don't forget the website, buildabaker.com. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I will include this in the uh, follow-up email as well. Very good. Excellent. Thank all you very right. much, Megan, for arranging this for me. I totally enjoyed it. For those of you that don't know, this is the first time I'm doing a webinar class. All of my classes are workshops where I see the students and they bake with me. This was the first time we did a webinar. I didn't see any of you. I have no idea how many are out there. Megan tells me there's a lot. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was a blast. I had a great time. Excellent. Thank you so much. And we will see you next time. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye.